I want to ask you a question before I get started in this passage, though. Have you ever had someone in your life um, that you would be afraid to see after you made a mistake? Somebody that, you know, when you mess up, and then and you, the last person you possibly want to see is this person. Maybe, maybe for some of you, uh, it was your father or it was your mother. Um, maybe for others, it was a boss that you had in your past. Uh, maybe for some of you, it's the boss you have in your present. Um, maybe for some of you, it's your spouse. And, and you know that you've messed up and, and you, you just... You just know what their response is going to be like. You just know how they're going to act towards you and the the mistake that you've made. I think that's a pretty common experience for everybody here in this room, right? We've had somebody like that, that it's just, our, our nature is really to hide and hope that they never find out, right? But sometimes in life, it doesn't work that way. You, you have to you have to confront them, you have to see them, you have to talk to them face to face again. And we know that, you know, they're just they're just gonna chew us out. I mean, they're just they're never gonna let us hear the end of it. And and typically what happens is it's it's not only that they're reminding us of this failure, but then it's like they reach into their back pocket and say, you know what? Remember the time you did this, and remember the time you did this, and remember the, this is just like this. You, you're just acting the same. You just you never change, right? And so part of the, the wanting to hide the current mistake is, is going, man, now they're going to have another thing for that list. And the next time I mess up, the next time I go see them, they're going to pull it out, and the list is going to be a little bit longer than it was the last time. And so... We see them, they, they blast us, and we leave with our head hung low, knowing that we've got another failure to add to that list. Typically, when you find yourself in a relationship like that, with that kind of person, you live your life to find approval. You, you, you find yourself just naturally trying to figure out where you stand because you are uncertain of where you stand at all times. And and this is a a scary place to be. Because you never really know, like, does this person love me or not? Do they accept me? Yeah, they say it, but the first time I make a mistake, it's just, man, they just, they lower the boom. And so you find yourself living out of fear. And you're constantly trying to prove yourself to this person. This morning, I want to show you the way Jesus responds. Because it could not be farther from that experience than anything else. I want you to think about for a second, because I think sometimes these resurrection texts and and these these texts right here at the end, they get preached a lot, so it's just real easy for us to just kind of, you know, if if you've been in church, to go, hey, yeah, yeah, I've heard all this. But I want you to slow down and just think about where the disciples are in their lives. They've spent the last couple of years following this guy, saying, you're the one. We'll follow you anywhere. We'll go to death. We don't care. We're, we're going to be right by your side. And then one by one, they fail. Deny him multiple times. I don't know that guy. What are you talking about? Right? And in this text, they're going to come face to face with him. They've screwed up. They've made a lot of mistakes. And the question that... that that just jumps out to me at this text is, how is Jesus going to respond? To bring you up to speed, if you haven't been with us this last couple of weeks, this this text is kind of 
bringing us back. We're told by Luke that they, they're immediately, um, the, the disciples that Jesus had just talked about on the way to Emmaus, they turned around and immediately went back to Jerusalem. And, and they're sharing all that had happened to them because Jesus appeared to them first. And, and so they're coming back saying, hey guys, Jesus is, is risen, right? He, he, this, is, this is really happening. I know these ladies said it, and we thought it was this crazy story because, you know, they're ladies and they make up stories sometimes, but no, it's real, right? This is, this is really happening. Jesus is really alive. And so they're on their way back. They're talking to the 11. It's kind of the, the core of the apostles that Jesus had left, minus Judas. And they go back and they tell him, hey, Jesus is raised from the dead, and they're sharing with the other disciples everything that they've seen. And again, think about it. You're, you're one of those 11. You, you have been one of those people who have denied him, abandoned him, failed to believe what he had been saying all along. And then Jesus responds. And, and we're going to see how he responds to seeing his disciples for the first time after all of those mistakes, all of those failures. So this morning, we're going we're gonna to look at verses 36. I'm going to start in uh, verse 36 of Luke chapter 24. And it's been our custom. We'll read it together as a church. So we'll put it up on the screen. And if you would, read along with me. Three, two, one. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still believed for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Amen. So, in this passage, we're, we're told, as I told you in this whole chapter, there's a theme running through every panel, and that's Jesus pointing them back to the Scriptures, right? The, the angel pointing the ladies back to the Scriptures. Jesus, on the road to Emmaus, pointing them back to Scriptures. Again, we see Jesus doing the same thing with his disciples. The, the foundation for which their hope rests upon is what God has said, right? Right? And so Jesus is pointing them back. This, this is all things that had to happen. These are all things that had to be revealed in time. And so now Jesus is standing before them. And there's, there's joy, right? They're, 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 they're kind of startled. They're not sure what to do. They're scared. Can you just, can you just take a second and just imagine what would be going through your mind in that moment, right? It's, it's easy for us to sit back and judge these guys, but, but think about it. Like, Jesus is, you saw him die. You saw him breathe his last breath, right? Luke, Luke has told us that for most of the time of the crucifixion, the disciples were at a distance watching everything that was happening. It wasn't that just somebody told them about him being crucified. They watched it happen. They saw him get taken down from the cross, a dead man, and laid in a tomb. And now, here he is. He's standing in front of them. And he's speaking to his disciples. Now again, think about 
What do you, what do you think is the first thing he's going to say to us? <laughs> we, we had this big game. We talked a big game before the crucifixion. We said we were going to do all these things before the crucifixion. But when the suffering came, we ran. When, when the death came, we really ran. Right? What's he going to say to us? How, how is he going to respond to us? Notice what Jesus' first words are. Peace to you. Jesus is speaking a blessing to them. That, can you imagine that person I was talking about earlier in your life? Could you imagine them responding this way to you when you make a mistake? So this, this is completely the opposite of that. We, we have a Savior that is so much better than anything we have ever experienced or understood. Even in the best of relationships, Jesus is better. And we see that here in multiple ways in this passage. Because again, they've denied him, they've abandoned him, they've betrayed him, they've not believed him. And yet, what are the words that Jesus speaks to them? His first words are peace. Peace. For the most part, they had been utter failures up until this point. And yet, Jesus doesn't come in with the whip and the, hey, let me, it's time for correction. You guys didn't get this. I, I need to lower the boom on you. I need to help you to get this. I need to help you to see this. No, it's, it's peace. And even later, when they're troubled, do you remember how he speaks to them? He uses the, the words of comfort, just like in John 14, 1. Remember when he's going to the cross, but on that night of the betrayal, he's telling them, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. You see, Jesus is a Savior who speaks peace to sinners. He's a Savior that speaks peace to sinners. And his marvelous, forgiving spirit is on full display in this passage here. He, he could have sat there and recounted in excruciating detail all of their failures. Right? So some of you, again, you, you, you have that experience with someone in your life that, that when you make a mistake, they just sit there and they just, well, let me just go through all the ways you have screwed up. And yeah, that's not what Jesus does. We, we see this forgiving spirit. You remember what he said in John 16, peace I give to you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. I have overcome the world. And now he's standing before them, he's saying to them, peace be to you. We see the forgiveness of Jesus in this passage. That, that's the kind of forgiving Savior that we have this morning. If you put your faith and trust in Him, this is, this is what you can expect. This is, you, this is how you can expect Him to respond to you when you mess up. When you go to Him and you confess, this is what I've done. You're not going to get condemnation. You're going to get peace to you. He knows everything about you. He, he knows every thought that you've ever thought. He knows everything that there is to condemn you, and yet he says peace to you. Because that's the good news this morning, that, that each of us here, that no one wants to be forgiven more than he is ready to forgive. Let me say that again. None of you are sitting here this morning wanting more to be forgiven than he is ready to forgive. That's the kind of Savior Jesus is. There's no one in this world who's ever wanted to pardon you more than he's ready to pardon you this morning. See, this, this is a heart of love that Jesus has for us. It's on full display here when he comes to see his disciples and the way he responds 
to his disciples. He, he could have said, you know what, guys, I told you so. I told you all these things were going to happen. Why didn't you believe me? What's wrong with you knuckleheads? How many times do I have to tell you this stuff? But he says, peace to you. Now, there's, there's not only in that a word for our comfort as we consider how he knows our sin and yet he still is loving and forgiving towards us. But there's also a word in there for how we should treat others. If we're going to say we're followers of Jesus and that we're following his example and we're following his model of life, how could, how could followers of that kind of Savior, how could, how could we have that kind of forgiving Lord treasure up bitterness in our hearts and refuse to forgive others? How could we do that? We, we have this Savior who just is abundant in forgiveness. And yet, how can we sit here and hold on to all this unforgiveness? We need to be more like Jesus. We need to follow the example that Jesus is setting here. For us. Because the reality is, guys, this morning, no matter what they did to you, what he has forgiven in you is greater. It doesn't matter what they've done. Jesus has forgiven way more from, for you than you'll ever be asked to forgive of them. We should have hearts like our Savior who said peace to these faithless disciples. And Jesus speaks peace to sinners, and, and that's good news for us. It, it should be an encouragement to us. It should be an encouragement to us forgiven sinners to be forgiving. He taught us to pray, Lord, Forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's no wonder he's a forgiving Savior. This is what he's been teaching us from the very beginning. But not only do we have a forgiving Savior, we have a Savior. I want, I want you to see in this passage the condensation of Jesus, right? He, he's, he's a savior who's concerned to condescend himself to his disciples' needs. And you see that, especially in verses 37 through 43. Notice how Jesus condescends to attest himself to these startled, disbelieving disciples. When Jesus speaks to them in verse 37, their reaction is they're, they're startled, they're frightened, they're scared, right? They think they've seen a ghost or whatever. And so again, at that point, Jesus could have gotten impatient with them. I mean, stop and think about it. What else do I have to do? I just rose myself from the dead and I'm standing here. Like, how thick are you guys? He could have gotten impatient with them. You know what? He had every right to. He's God. He could have demanded them, just believe me. I'm standing here. Believe me. That could have been his stance, right? Some of you maybe grew up in a house like that. It doesn't matter whether I'm right. You just have to trust me, right? Right? And no, no, that's, that's not, not what Jesus does. Again, he doesn't have to, but he's choosing to, to condescend, to come down to their level, to make himself lowly to them. 
Instead of being impatient with this, instead of being angry with them, Jesus says, look at my hands. Look at my feet. Look at the scars. I'm real. I've got a body. Ghosts don't have bodies. It's me. I'm right here in front of you. And then he says the, the, the strangest thing. When the disciples hear him say this, notice what it says in verse 41. They still disbelieved for joy. That's <laughs> That's a weird way of saying that, right? Their hearts are beginning to lighten. They're beginning to have a joy of like, maybe this could be real, but they're still disbelieving. It's like, it's yeah, it's too good to be true. And Jesus says what? Anybody got anything to eat? <laughs> right? You guys still aren't believing me. I'm showing you my body. I'm letting you touch it. I'm not a ghost. I'm not a vision. I'm not an apparition, right? Touch me. You, you can see. that. Oh, that's not enough. That's not doing it for you. Again, he could have been impatient and angry at that point. But that's not how our Savior responds. No. He says, give me something to eat. Now, I'm sure they've never seen ghost eat before so maybe, maybe that'll make it click maybe that'll make it real to them again do you see how he's condescending to their need they are struggling to believe and jesus is choosing time after time to lower himself not demand not force but lower himself willingly Right? I mean, that, that's what he did when he took on flesh in the first place, right? Stepping out of heaven and, and lowering himself to become a human, right? But, but he's still doing it. That wasn't a one time, that wasn't a one off, it wasn't a one time thing. It's something he continues to do even to this day. Continues to make himself known to us in real ways to this day. And, and look, he's not, he's not asking the disciples to like contradict their senses, right? It's not just a voice from heaven saying, believe in me, I'm alive, trust me. He could have done that. And you know what? He's God. He would have been perfectly right to do that. But that's not what he did. Again, he chose to lower himself. He chose that so that his disciples didn't have to contradict their senses. They could trust their senses. Touch. Watch me eat. <laughs> the, the fish doesn't fall right through me. <laughs> right? You can believe me. Jesus is so kind. <laughs> He's so kind. Again, because I don't, I don't think that's how most of us would have responded. If we're being honest with ourselves, we would have... We would have listen, just trust me. I'm standing here. I'm not doing anything else. Just trust me. But that's, he's so kind and he's so patient. And he's constantly lowering himself. Willingly. Choosing to. Right? Nobody's making it. He's choosing to do that for his disciples. Now Jesus is saying, I'm real, and I'm asking you to believe me. Not because I'm, I'm not real, but because I am. I'm asking you to believe me, because not because I'm a spirit and that I don't have a body, but because I do have a body. I'm standing right here in front of you. He attests to the realities of his resurrection. Right? This, this, is, this is what the Christian faith hinges upon, is the reality of the resurrection. And Jesus is giving them every evidence of that resurrection. I talked about this uh, last week, I think it was like, how, how all of a sudden... Judaism could just turn on a dime and so many Jewish people could suddenly follow Jesus. 
The only way that makes sense is the resurrection, is eyewitness firsthand accounts of the resurrection. That's it. That's the only thing that would make so many people who are believing this way suddenly turn and go this way. It's not just a, oh, that makes sense, and this is a good illogical argument. No, we saw him. And again, Jesus is just, he's so patient with his disciples. And again, we see finally this theme that runs all through chapter 24. Remember his words. Verses 44 to 47, he opens their minds to understand the scriptures. These words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, he, he takes them back. He, he takes those words and he illuminates. He opens up the scripture. He helps them to see. Right? Same thing that happened at the tomb when the angel is there and the women show up. Remember his words. The two disciples, as they're walking along the street and they're struggling with disbelief and hopelessness, and he took them where? To the scriptures. And he taught them all the things that the scripture said about the Messiah. And now, again, for a third time. So do you think Luke is trying to make a point here? Right? Anytime the Bible is repeating itself over and over again, you should really pay attention. So this is the third time in this passage. He's really pressing this point home for us. Again, the disciples are taken to the scriptures, to the words of Jesus. And so Jesus opens up their minds. He helps them to understand the scriptures. And he says, these are the words that I told you about before I was crucified. Before I was dead. Before I was buried. Before I'm standing before you right now. These are the very things that the scriptures were teaching about me. And I want you to see that. I want you to understand that everything that happened had to happen. It was necessary to happen. Have you ever had that experience? Have you ever, have you ever had a passage? Have you ever been taught a passage of Scripture that, that's been there for 3,000 years and then just all of a sudden, even though you may have read it a hundred times, it just, boom, but suddenly your eyes are open and you just see it. happens to me all the time. <laughs> the more I study, the more I read, the more I'm just, I'm just, God is constantly showing me this stuff. And it's not that it's like some kind of new teaching or whatever. Like it's, it's not like, whoo, this is revolutionary. No, it's just, I, it was there the whole time. I just couldn't see it. And that's what's happened to these disciples is Jesus is he's opening their eyes to the scripture so that they can see him. He's helping them and teaching them so that they can understand that all of these things were necessary. He's not teaching them anything new. He's just teaching them what had been taught in God's word all along that they missed. And that's one of the reasons why, guys, it's so important to put yourself under the Word of God regularly. Put yourself under the Word of God daily. And expect and pray that the Holy Spirit would open your eyes to read it. Listen, this, this is a testimony I've heard of so many people that, that come in to the faith is they read the Bible, and they're like, Dale, this doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, yeah, keep reading it. Like, yeah, but it doesn't make any sense. I should read something else. No, nope. keep reading it. And then six months or a year goes by, and they come up to me, and they're like, man, I was reading the other day in Ezekiel, and all of a sudden, it just made sense. Like, like when, when Jesus is... In, in Ezekiel 34, he's talking about those, those leaders as shepherds that weren't caring for Israel and they were just stealing from them and taking advantage of them. God just showed me that that's, that's the way a lot of Christians act nowadays. There, there's, there's a lot of, of, of pastors that act just like that. I never saw that, but I just thought I was talking about shepherds. I didn't realize that. 
What's happened? Has that word changed? Nope. Exactly the same. But the Holy Spirit has begun to open their eyes and help them to see and understand. And that only happens as you continually put yourself under the Word of God, asking the Holy Spirit to open it up, open up your mind, open up your eyes so that you can see what it's saying. Guys, this is, this is vital for our faith. So many people are new believers and they languish as toddlers for far too long because they read the Bible and don't get anything out of it. Let me set the expectation for you if you're here this morning or if you're watching this morning and you're a new believer, you're probably not going to at first. That's okay. Keep reading it. Keep reading it. Because as you grow and as you mature and the Holy Spirit begins to open your eyes, you begin to see. I was preaching last week about how all of Scripture, everything is pointing to Jesus. For some of you, if I were to hand you the Old Testament, you'd have a hard time showing me how all that stuff in the Old Testament is pointing to Jesus. But I promise you, it does. And the more you study and the more you put yourself under God's word and the more you read and the more you start to see the connections and God starts connecting the dots, it's like, oh my gosh, it is all about Jesus. It's all pointing to him. And man, listen, that's when the Bible gets really exciting. Because you know everything you're reading is is teaching you something about this Savior who's so patient with us. Who's so forgiving. He's so loving. He's so not like us. (laughs) Praise God. And that's exactly what Jesus does here. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Guys, these guys had been reading the scriptures their whole life and didn't understand them. Don't be afraid of reading them for a month or a couple of years and not understanding them. They had been memorizing them their whole life and still didn't understand them. Don't let that stop you. Keep reading. In closing, I just want to encourage you guys this morning. There there are two ways to live the Christian life. One author puts it like this. You can live it either for the heart of Christ or from the heart of Christ. You can live for the smile of God or from it. And I started out this this message talking about how most of us have had that experience of that person that we have been in fear of. Because all they do is drop judgment and condemnation on us. And so what we do is we work really hard to find approval for that person. We try really hard not to mess up so that that person will approve of us. I hope you've seen this morning as we look at how Jesus has responded to these disciples that Jesus is nothing like that. That that you're not here this morning, I hope, living for the heart of Christ. You're living from the heart of Christ. You're you're not here because you want to make God smile. You're, You're living from it. You come here to worship Because you want to, not because you have to. See, even within the church, it's easy for us because we have so many human examples of this harsh, judgmental leadership in our lives. It's easy for us to start in faith and remember, oh, Jesus, he saved me. I can't do anything. And then to slide over here and to think, I got to do these things. Or he's not going to be happy with me. Because we we should be living out of our identity as a son or daughter of God. We're, We're living out of our union with Christ. John Newton once wrote, Are you not amazed sometimes? That you should have such, you should have so much as a hope that poor and needy as you are, the Lord thinks of you. But let not all of you feel 
feel discouraged. For if our physician is almighty, our disease cannot be desperate. And if he casts none of none out who come to him, why should you fear? Our sins are many, but his mercies are more. Our sins are great, but his righteousness is greater. We are weak, but he is power. Most of our complaints are owing to unbelief and to the remainder of a legal spirit. Now, Newton is showing us Christ's heart here, and yet he's also pointing out our weakness, and he calls it a a legal spirit. That's an 18th century way of referring to works of righteousness or legalism. The, The subtle proclivity to seek to leverage Christ's favor with our behavior. And one of the reasons we have a diminished awareness of the heart of Christ is that we are blindly operating out of a legal spirit. See, this morning some of you are here and you are believers and you're listening to me describe how Jesus is responding to these disciples and you're going, I have a hard time believing that. Even though I'm a believer, I have a hard time believing that. Newton would say that that's, that's the residue of that legalism in, in your heart that's still there. And, and, and some of you think, well, yeah, but, but there's got to be some judgment and some condemnation and we've got to have all that. And again, he would say that that's the remnant of that legalism living in your heart. Because Jesus took all the condemnation. He, he took all of the judgment, all of the sin upon himself. Now, that, that doesn't mean that we don't confess and repent when we find ourselves doing wrong. But, but the conversation looks totally different than that worldly example that so many of us have, where, where we walk in and we got our head down low and we're just like, okay, here we're going to get it, we're going to get it. And they unload on us and maybe they say we're forgiven, but man, we just feel like, oh, this is horrible and I'm, just, I'm the worst person in the world. That should not be the experience of confession and repentance. Confession and repentance should be going to the Father and saying, Father, this is what I've done. And I'm asking you to forgive me and and to help me to not do it again. Because I I don't want to live that way anymore. I don't want to think that way anymore. And I'm thankful that your son was sent to die for me because you knew I was going to do that. And and you took care of it on the cross. And so I'm leaving here with my head held high in worship and praise of the kind of Savior that I have that speaks, peace be to you. Some of you struggle to confess and repent of your sin. I would argue because you've had too much of this human example of what happens when you do. And some of you got to a place where you're like, well, I just I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to keep it to myself. To your own detriment. You're the one suffering. When you really begin to see, when you really begin to understand how patient and loving and forgiving of a Savior we have, you should be running to confess and repent. The minute you realize that you're sinning, you should be running to Him. Not living in fear of Him. This morning, as you think about your life, which of these two examples is more of how you see God? And specifically, how you see Jesus? And for those of you who are here and you've never put your faith and trust, maybe you're thinking, I'm just too bad. I'm just, I, there's not enough forgiveness in the world to cover what I've done. I promise you. You can't want forgiveness more than he wants to forgive you. Put your faith and trust in him and what he did on the cross. And how he was raised from the dead. So that you also might join him in eternal life. And for those of you who are here this morning, I just want to challenge you. You have a forgiving Savior. 
are you forgiving? Is, is there something that you're holding on to or some anger you have towards someone? You're calling yourself a Christian. You say you're a follower of Jesus, but you ain't acting anything like him. Would you just confess and repent of that this morning? And, and then take that step when you leave here to pick up the phone or drive and go see that person and confess and repent to them? Do you, do you live your life not confessing and repenting? Because you're afraid of how Jesus is going to respond. Guys, he is the most gentle patient, loving Savior you will ever experience. Don't let that be an excuse to turn to the one that can actually help you. Turn to him this morning, no matter where you're at. Let's pray. Father, God, we thank you so much that not only do we have a Savior who made himself low and, and took on flesh, but God, who continues to intercede on our behalf, as Brian said earlier in the service, God, he, he, even, even right now, he's interceding for some of us because we're sinning as we're sitting here, lying to ourselves, telling us this isn't us. I don't have a problem with unforgiveness. Jesus is making intercession for them right now. Oh, how patient he is with us. Father, I pray this morning that that forgiveness and that patience would fuel us to be patient with others, to be forgiving to others, to not hold on to grudges. So we're so thankful that, that you don't. And Father, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, Again, maybe, maybe they've been afraid because of the life that they lived and, and all the sin that they have come to realize. And then they just think this morning that you can't save them. God, I pray this morning you would just, your Holy Spirit would just touch their hearts. And then they'd turn it all over to you and begin to live their life for you. And finally, Lord, I just pray for those of us who claim to be believers and yet we're not putting ourselves under your word regularly, that we would just confess and repent of that this morning. And if nothing else, we would leave here today putting ourselves under your word regularly and praying and asking your Holy Spirit to open our eyes and understand your word. Father, I ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.